Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ansible Certified Content Collection for ServiceNow webinar. A few things before we kick it off. This webinar will be recorded, and the slides will be made available. Um, you'll be receiving an email tomorrow with all that information. We also have a Q&A box available for you. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please drop your question there, and we will have one of our webinar hosts answer them for you. And without any further ado, I will pass it off. So I guess it's me. Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to this webinar. Um, I'm Massimo Ferrari. I'm one of the product managers in the Ansible team. And what I will do today, you know, is introduce you. He's doing, he's doing, let's say, a long introduction to the demo, which I assume is what you, uh, what everyone wants to see. And uh, what I'd like to do is basically set the stage a little bit about what we've been doing with ServiceNow, what this whole idea that we have around supported um, certified content collections and uh, uh, solutions that are attached to those collections. So. To give you an idea, you know, before we start, to give an idea of the, the scope or the context that we'll be discussing today, imagine the Ansible Automation Platform as a product as split in two zones. So you have the platform components, basically everything that you use to run, provide governance, ha <laughs> have visibility, um, manage your automation assets, okay? so content collections, playbooks, and roles, and then you have another side of the house, which is what we call content. Content is a set of vertical initiatives that we generally attach or dedicate to a certain area of IT or a specific set of use cases or a very specific um, uh, audience, let's say that, where we provide first opinionated content, meaning integrations that are specifically designed to support that audience, use cases, slice of the market, slice of IT. And on the other hand, we provide guidance and we provide, you know, documentation and we provide everything that is needed for customers to, uh, let's say, be up to speed and become productive faster, right? So today we'll be focusing on the content side of the house. So everything that you are going to see is related to the use cases that we are enabling between the Ansible Automation Platform and ServiceNow. Um, next slide, please. All right, that's awesome. Next slide, please. There we go. So um, let me set the stage just a little, right? Because I'm sure you all know ServiceNow, and I'm sure most of you know the Ansible Automation Platform. Um, I just want to make sure that we all understand why we've been embarking in this effort of producing this certified content collection, what the general idea is behind that, and what is the market direction or the state of the market in this specific context. So the situation where we are right now is that if you are a large organization, if you, have a, if you are an IT organization in general, you are dealing with two different worlds or two different areas, right? On one hand, especially if you look at large organizations, on one hand, you have, uh, you see the benefit of adopting next generation operational models, next generation practices. For example, you know, think about DevOps, think about DevSecOps, think about any agile methodology. You see that as, as a customer, as an organization, you see that as a way to increase and provide agility as a way to prototype faster, as a way to release faster, as a way to uh, boost the ability of your developers and your IT organization in general to produce more and support the business in a better way. On the other end, you know, there is an entire world of risk management and governance that looks at those practices and tries to figure out a way to apply the same level of control and the same level of governance that is needed in any large organization is needed for any customer, you know, without in, in, in any way diminishing or, um, you know, blocking the real advantage that are, there are advantages that are brought by those initiatives. So we are here and the work that we've been doing is to support customers that are in this journey or to provide a solution in this sweet spot between um, the governance, risk management, and control that is provided traditionally by ITSM processes and everything that is provided by uh, modern practices. Knowing that, 
most of those modern practices are enabled. So think about that as a core building block, as a foundational technology. Um, those are enabled by automation, right? So that's the place where we are. You know, when we started this journey, we had large organizations in mind, but that's honestly a very common problem in any organization. Um, and, and the idea is to find a way to combine the right level of governance and the right level of agility. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now, um, a very important thing is that if you look at automation as a building block, automation used to be, well, it, automation has been around for a very long time, right? And uh, um, what, what is the difference between what we had 20 years ago and what we have now is that automation is now approached in a more modern fashion. And automation used to be 20 years ago, very selfish or very opportunistic. I'm doing something, you know, to solve an issue that I have, a tactical issue, and to avoid doing something again, right? That was the whole logic. Now, when you transition to a modern world, automation is not anymore a selfish exercise, something that is concentrated in a single stream to a single task to a single group of use cases. Now automation is A, more pervasive, B, is an enabler. Right, as we said before, is at the base of many of the modern practices that we have right now. And the whole idea is that because of that, you know, now it needs to have characteristics that are unique and that are, well, they're, they are new and, and we didn't have before. So the whole idea of adopting automation is to adopt the right framework and the right tool and the right product, making sure that those characteristics, there are you know, the ability to foster collaboration, the ability to provide visibility and simplicity to the, whole, um, to the whole processes that you want to automate, and the ability to span across multiple domains. You know, on one end is that, on the other end is making sure that you use that automation, you apply those characteristics, you apply those tools to make sure that um, the existing management practices, change management practices, and uh, um, remediation practices, and governance practices are better supported to basically taking what you have and make sure that it's just more efficient, and then using those new characteristics, those new capabilities as the base for anything new that you want to build. Next slide, please. And that's what we have. That's what we decided to do. Basically, we decided to take the best of two worlds or try to take the best of two worlds and combine them together. So on one hand, we have ServiceNow, which is, as we all know, one of the market leaders in, uh, in the ATSM space. And we consider ServiceNow as the classic business interface, the classic place where if you are in rich management, if you are an ATSM person, if you are a governance person, that's your entry point. That's your primary interface. And on the other hand, we wanted to find a way to combine that with the Ansible Automation Platform. Ansible Automation Platform being an example, a good example, I would say, uh, of modern automation. And is modern automation, it spans across many, many different domains. So the small icons that you, saw, that you see down there, they kind of represent, you know, data center, cloud, networking and security as the main content domains that we cover. Once again, if you look at content, it's a collection of different vertical exercises uh, directed to a certain set of use cases. And those are the main domains that we have. So they are split by domains. That there is much more that we do. There is much more that we can do. But those are kind of formalized effort. And as a good example of modern automation, as a good example of a platform that provides all the characteristics that I mentioned before and spans across multiple IT domains, that's a classic technical interface. That's the classic entry point for technical teams, IT teams, in different areas of IT to start doing their job or to trigger their job, automate their job, manage whatever they have to manage. So the idea was to enable those interfaces, both of them, to work together and interoperate in classic ITSM scenarios, namely, change management, incident management, problem management, and um, let's say updating and maintaining a CMDB. Next slide, please. Now, um, 
the whole idea came to us, not in a dream, but obviously doing research. And uh, um, this is not net new. And uh, um, meaning that is not that we are pioneering something that is just unique to us because we thought about that. This is actually something that our customers implemented already. So as a certified content collection, or if you look at that as a solution, so think about that as a, as a is something that spans across those two platforms and enable you to do multiple things. If you look at that from that standpoint, right, um, you, we, we saw that implemented already. That, that's brand new. It's something that we announced only recently, but we saw that happening kind of organically across the board in multiple customers, in multiple large organizations. There are a couple of examples here. They are anonymous, but that doesn't really matter. So what is important, what is the key message of this slide is basically that you can look at different industries, you know, very different, you know, from government organization to FSIs to oil and gas. And you see how they used, they combine ServiceNow and the Ansible Automation Platform to obtain exactly um, what I described before to solve, it's not an issue, but basically to bridge that gap that a lot of organizations, a lot of organizations are feeling. And again, there are a couple of examples of use cases that they, that they implemented. Uh, we, we chose one example for each one of them. The truth is that most of them are doing multiple things. Um, I believe that um, key elements that are worth to be mentioned are basically um, the idea of having ServiceNow customers that are, that are implementing this solution to have ServiceNow as the front end for any automation, basically as a way to track, initiate, instantiate, and track all the automation that they run. <coughs> customers that are using um, Ansible to manage tickets, so kind of the opposite way around, okay? So people that are using Ansible to make sure that all the tickets that are generated uh, inside ServiceNow are kept up to date, you know, con um, um, based on the events and the activities that they run through automation. Um, then there is classic discovery use cases. So in case of this financial service, gathering facts, that's basically a discovery exercise or a mapping exercise, and then taking those information. So you go down into your infrastructure, you read everything that you have, and then you bring all those information back to the CMDB. So now you have your CMDB that is supposedly up to date. You can use that as a single source of truth. You can clean up the data, whether it's that configuration, naming convention, IP address, et cetera, et cetera, and you can use that to make decisions. And um, last but not least, uh, the whole idea of using that as a closed, a closed loop process. So basically having um, a more consistent development process that allows people to maintain any, any sort of DevOps-ish kind of exercise they are doing, but at the same, at the same time creates a, a paper trail of everything that has been done, and that paper trail is stored inside ServiceNow. Next slide, please. Now, um, I'm kind of doing an intro to what you are going to see in, uh, um, in, in the demo. But the point that I want to remark here is basically that we really wanted to enable the two interfaces that I described before, so the business interface and the technical interface, to work together. The whole logic behind that is that if you are a business person, a risk management or governance person, ITSM person, your process always starts from ServiceNow. It starts from ServiceNow and then extends into the Ansible Automation Platform to execute whatever you need to be executed as part of a change management ticket, for example. On the other hand, if you are a technical team, a technical person, you, A, may not have access to ServiceNow, B, you may have access to ServiceNow, but maybe using the ServiceNow interface or opening tickets, it's, um, it's very time consuming for you, or it could be difficult for you because you haven't been trained on that, or maybe you are just more familiar with the tools that you're already using. And you would like to use whatever you have in house, you know, to do the job that you have to do, but at the same time maintain um, the, the, this level of integrity of the data and the information uh, that belongs to this whole concept of having a closed loop. So having a closed loop means that whether an action, any sort of change is triggered through ServiceNow or is triggered through the Ansible Automation Platform, one, 
each each one of them is always kept up to date. And to do that, we need basically um, a two ways communication. So from the world of service now, there is the Ansible scope, which is part of the integration hub package that is provided by ServiceNow and is the way that ServiceNow uses to connect to Ansible controller. So the user interface and enterprise grade management component of the Ansible automation platform to trigger job templates, to trigger actions. On the other hand, what we are providing to do the way back is what is inside the certified content collection, which is a combination of ServiceNow modules. So modules is the name that we give to the integration that perform actions. Let's say that command and control a third party platform. So we have those integrations in the content collection. Plus we have a CMDB inventory plugin. CMDB inventory plugin in the Ansible world means a connector that allows us to read the ServiceNow CMDB populate the Ansible inventory and execute actions, tasks against this dynamically populated inventory. So to summarize what you need to implement what we are about to show you, what we're about to describe, you have your way in from ServiceNow to the Ansible automation platform, that's the spoke connector, and then you have your way in from the Ansible automation platform to ServiceNow, that is, uh, that are the integrations provided by the certified content collection. Next slide, please. Um, and to give you a visual representation of how that is going to look like, um, that's a, a sort of a logical architecture that's very simple, but it gives you an idea of what you get and what you can do um, with with the different components that I just described. So on the left, you have ServiceNow and three components, three pieces of ServiceNow that are the ones we are going to interact with. So you have the ServiceNow requests, you have the now workflows, and then you have the ServiceNow CMDB. On the right, you have the Ansible Automation Platform and two major entities inside the Ansible Automation Platform. One is inventory, the other one are the power job templates. And underneath the Ansible Automation Platform, you have, well, everything else, right? All your infrastructure, all the things that you want to automate. Once again, between data center, meaning the classic infrastructure, cloud networking, and, uh, uh, and security. Now, if you see the uh, tiny, we should, have, um, we should have drawn those lines a little bit thicker. But if you look at the very first arrow that goes to the, to the right, basically, you see how the spoke plugin is that integration, that connector that allows you to call from a ServiceNow workflow, call a tower job template. Now I guess it's called, Ansible Tower is the old name of Ansible Controller, so I would guess that now it's Controller Job Template. But that's the idea, that's our way in, and the two components that are interacting with each other are the Now Workflow and the Tower Job Template. Now, if you see that as a process, starting from ServiceNow, that's step one. So I have a workflow, I want to execute a set of actions, I want to execute the set of actions um, that are mapped in Ansible controller that are, uh, that are mapped in the Ansible automation platform, I want to execute those actions against an inventory, against a set of targets. And now is where you get the other way around, is where you get the content that is contained in ServiceNow collection. So if you look at the box, at the red box, first item that is triggered here, again, think about that as a process, a top-down process. First element that is triggered is the inventory plugin. Inventory plugins, fishes, the targets from the ServiceNow CMDB and pulls them inside the Ansible inventory. Now from the Ansible inventory, we uh, can execute, so now we have the, the controller job templates triggered, we have the inventory, so we can go down and execute everything that we need to execute. Now let's imagine that we provision something. Maybe we provision something in the cloud. So now there are information that we want to bring back to the CMDB. And that's what you see is provided by the very first um, black arrow that you see going to the left that goes into CMDB. And that represents the idea that if you deployed something or you made a change in a target that is mapped in the CMDB, you can go back 
and update that target. Now, the idea is that, okay, I executed the action that you asked me to do. I'm giving you back the information in the CMDB if that is needed. But what is more important is that now I have a way always through the ServiceNow modules to come back to the ServiceNow service request and update it. Where updating means here you are some additional information on the task that I executed or potentially move it forward, even closing it. So as part of the very same automation workflow that you're using to um, perform actions, make changes, as part of the very same workflow, you can go back to ServiceNow and manage, manipulate the original request to make sure that that get update, uh, updated or closed. Next slide, please. And oh, this is exactly the example uh, that, I, that I described before. I forgot that we had this slide. So basically, this is the very same logic. So same diagram as before. See that as a process. So we go very fast through that. This is a process triggered by a business user or a ServiceNow user. So as you can see, entry point is ServiceNow. I input a change request. The change request triggers a workflow. That workflow uses the Spoke plugin, goes to um, Ansible controller, and triggers a controller job template. Now, and that's number one. Number two is that, okay, I need to know what are the targets you want me to execute that job template. So I will use the inventory plugin to go to the ServiceNow CMDB, collect those targets, and put them in the Ansible inventory. Step number three, I will execute the tasks that you asked me to do against the target inventory that I dynamically populate. And then step number four, I will go back up to the change request and I will send you, I will populate that with the results of the task. Um, and uh, eventually I will close the change request that you open. Next slide, please. And this is an example of the other way around. The other way around is that I am a technical, I'm part of a technical team. What I do is using the Ansible Automation Platform every single day to do many, many tasks. That's my job. Now, I want to run a job template that I created in Ansible Controller because I need to make, maybe there is an event, maybe I'm doing a remediation, maybe there is something that hasn't been triggered by ServiceNow because it is an unplanned maintenance of sort. So I triggered the template, but since I want to make sure that everything is tracked into service now. Um, this very workflow, this very same job template that I'm running is going back to service now through the service now modules and is creating a change request. So that change request wasn't there before. I'm triggering the action on my end, but I want to make sure that that is tracked. So I create a new one. Now from there, the process is kind of the same. I trigger my, I, I, I call my inventory plugin and make sure that the Ansible inventory, the targets I'm executing against are up to date and are coming from the CMDB of choice, I mean, in this case is ServiceNow. So step two is always populating the Ansible inventory, then it's always the same. We execute against the target, we go back to the change request, we update with all the relevant information. Eventually, we update the CMDB if we need that, and then we close the change request. All of that automatically created from the Ansible Automation Platform, automatically created by a technical user, totally transparent, paper trail preserved. Next slide, please. Look at that, and I'm done. Uh, stage is yours, Will. All right, I guess it is my turn. Uh, so now we're gonna turn, um, turn our attention over to a live demo and see some of this actually uh, in action. So the first thing we're gonna talk about uh, before we get started is security, because when we're integrating two services together, especially a service that exists in the cloud and, and exists on-prem, security is a primary concern. So if we look at our example playbook right here, we'll see that we have a plain text password. 
that's no good. That's going to give anyone who has access to this playbook, who gets access to this playbook, whether authorized or unauthorized, the ability to make changes and take action in our ServiceNow instance. So our first step with the Ansible Automation platform is going to be to configure a custom credential. So we have a link to a blog here for this, and we also have this here on the screen, so you can come back and review it in the slides and the recording. But what I've done in my, um, in my Ansible Tower here is define a custom credential type, and this custom credential type is for ServiceNow, and it specifies the inputs that I want in a normal, when I go create a normal credential, like a machine credential or a cloud credential or, or anything like that, and then it's going to specify how those get passed to the modules. From there, I can go to my um, Tower Credential Vault, create credentials with the account that I'm going to use to access ServiceNow. All right, the next thing we're going to do is create an inventory so that we have all of the information that is in our CMDB, whether that was entered in manually or whether that's been um, populated through ServiceNow Discovery by crawling the network or pulling information in from our cloud provider, our vCenters, or, or other systems. And what the inventory plugin allows you to do is to specify the different types of the different fields, whether they're default fields in ServiceNow or custom fields that you've added to your instance. Specify what fields you want to populate in as host variables. And then also use some of those fields to create your groupings. So in this case, I'm pulling in the uh, environment and the sys ID. And as you know from, from as you may know from working with ServiceNow, that sys ID can be super important as I continue to do more automation uh, against the CMDB. So I will have those available as host variables to use in my playbook. And then I'm also creating groups for the different environments my systems live in, the sysclass name from ServiceNow so I know where it is in the CMDB, as well as the operating system that might have been picked up by, um, by ServiceNow Discovery. You can go on and, and continue to create other groups as, as it fits your environment, but this now gives me a great source of truth to pull information, uh, pull information from to populate my, my inventory in the Ansible Automation platform. So we're going to go back to um, back to my Ansible Tower server here, and we're going to look at a workflow that I have built, combining all the automation that I've been creating over time to build out a, a VM. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this workflow here, and anybody that can guess what one of my hobbies is from this demo, I'll send you some swag afterwards. But I'm going to go ahead and put in the VM name here. I'm going to leave all of the defaults here for what data center cluster network my machine is going to go on. I'm an, I can select an environment down here. So let's say I'll put this in the, I'll just leave it in the development environment. Why not? So it's in the development environment. I'll click next. I get one, that one last chance to review and make sure that I didn't uh, typo anything. And then I will launch this workflow. And now this workflow is going to go through and it's going to create my VM. Here, I'll, let's zoom in on it a little bit. It's going to create my VM. It's going to then update my inventory from vCenter so that it knows that machine exists. It's going to register that server with Red Hat and go ahead and install the um, Red Hat Insights agent so that I'm getting those proactive notifications from that service as well. Now that I'm registered and, and on the network, I'm going to go ahead and add a CI in ServiceNow to make sure that there's a record that, that we have a new server in the environment, it's in the development environment, it's registered with these subscriptions and so forth. And then I can continue into uh, config my base configuration management um, that goes onto my server. And while I do that, I'm also going to refresh my ServiceNow inventory because a lot of times we may have business rules or workflows or other defaults that pop into the CMDB as we add a new CI. So I wanna gather those before I get too far down my provisioning process. So I'm gonna refresh that inventory 
while I do configuration management, get all of those host bars and those groupings. And then finally, I'm gonna configure my monitoring server to add this to that, to that infrastructure. And we're gonna come back and see if, um, see if that pops up in my Grafana dashboard at the end. But what's happening behind these, these job templates here? So, first of all, um, we are going to create that configuration item in the CMDB. So we have the inventory, we're able to refresh that as part of, um, able to refresh that as part of the workflow. And then we're gonna add a new configuration item here. And we can use Ansible facts to populate that base amount of information in the CMDB. So you'll see everywhere I have the, the normal bracket notation for a, uh, for a variable, I'm using the Ansible host name, the default IP, uh, IPv4 address and MAC address. Um, since I'm pulling all this information, I know it's in the environment, so I'm gonna set the status to installed. I'm also gonna include the OS version, RAM, CPU. If I did provide that environment, I'm gonna add that. I'm gonna go ahead and add that in the CMDB as well. Specify what table I want that to, uh, item to exist in the CMDB. And then at the very bottom, I have that sysid field. So if this is a new server in the environment, I'm not gonna have a sysid variable and I'm just gonna omit that and move on. However, if I am pulling in my, um, my dynamic inventory, I know this machine is already in the CMDB, I'm gonna tell it to update the existing record based on that, uh, based on that, that sysid. Now, you probably saw all of those red lines going across my workflow, getting all the way to the end. Well, if there's a problem in the environment, I'm gonna wanna open up an incident. So, if we jump back to my workflow real quick, hopefully it hasn't failed. Um, but all of these, if I fail to make the VM, the inventory has a problem, I can't register um, to RHN, I can't run my configuration management. If any of that happens, I'm gonna, um, conclude a failed workflow by opening up an incident ticket so that I can um, come back and, and troubleshoot this. But when I open up that incident ticket, I'm not just opening up a, a static temp ticket that says automation failure. I'm using context from the automation platform, from the running job to say, hey, this job failed. Go look at this specific job ID. I can include the, the link to that job log in maybe the description of the ticket. Um, I can also go ahead and attach the, um, the item, the, the configuration item that, I add, that we just added to the CMDB, I can attach that to the ticket as well. So the goal here is to get us as far down the, uh, as far down the path of, of resolving this issue as we can, get as much information into that ticket so we don't waste, um, waste any more time than we have to. Now I can continue here, now that I've registered the incident there, and in subsequent playbooks or workflows, I can say, all right, I've seen this more than once. I wanna open up a problem. So now, I have the, now I've identified a problem in, uh, in the environment. It's related to, a net, to the network. I'm gonna open up a problem uh, for this, and I'm gonna go back to those incidents, and I'm going to attach this problem to those incidents. Again, something I'm gonna have to go do in the UI of ServiceNow, it's gonna take my time away from fixing the problem and leave me to put, um, clicking buttons to keep, um, to keep all the reports in order. So after I attach that, that incident, I'm gonna go off and do my analysis. And as I start to write my playbook to, um, to resolve this, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna change the status of that problem, um, change the state of that, assign it to someone else, and then open up a new change request for the actions, the, um, the actions against my Cisco router here that I'm about to take to resolve the, um, to resolve the problem. So I can start my actual change playbook. Right, I can do change management as code here. Start my playbook saying, here's the problem that 
this applies to. Here's the change that I need to open before the, the next tasks run. Um, and then as I get into that, I can update the problem again um, that I have, you know, that I've done the root cause analysis and should have automated this the first time because the error ended up being somebody fat fingered a, a configuration. And then I'm going to change the state of the problem that uh, I have a fix in, in progress. So you can see how you can start to take these actions that normally um, you normally have to do in your ITSM system and you can integrate them into your automation, um, into your automation workflows. So um, let's go back and, and take a look at our workflow and see how it turned out. So it looks like we had a successful workflow. Everything is green and we got all the way here to the end. Let's check a couple of these um, jobs and see what they actually see what they actually look like. So here it's built our new server. Let's just see what that IP address looks like. Looks like we got 10.0.0.102 given out from uh, for our new server. And at the end of this, I wanted this server to be in monitoring so that it was ready to be on the um, on the network. Let's go ahead and switch over to my to my monitoring dashboard and let's see if it got added in here. We'll give it a quick refresh. And now we see there's my new server 10.0.0.102. And I'm starting to collect metrics and um, on this server and I know it's always going to be here. Also, my process of getting my servers that are in vCenter, also in the CMDB, into, um, into the monitoring server. Now that I have an automated process to do that, I could run this, I could run this nightly, I could put this on a schedule in my, in my Ansible controller so that I always make sure that my monitoring server is properly configured for the machines that are running in vCenter based on their categorization in the CMDB. And finally, let's take a look over at uh, ServiceNow. Let's take a look at my CMDB and see, and see if my server is now there. So we'll search for servers here. And we'll go to all. And there's my new server. We're going to click on that. We see that it's in the development environment, like I told it when I filled out my survey at the beginning of my workflow. I see that it's version 8.2 here, and I have my, my memory over there as well, and my CPU count. I can even go back to my dashboard and see that on this server, yep, there it is. I'm getting reported back one CPU and 791 meg of memory. And when I go back into my CMDB, that's exactly what it's been, uh, what it's been updated to. And I can also check and see in my incidents, any of my open incidents, I don't see any incidents re related to Ansible. I'll just search to make sure nothing related to to Ansible, I'm in the clear there as well. So, like Massimo was talking about earlier, we're able to take, uh, with these the new certified content collection for, uh, for ServiceNow, we're able to extend what we do with our Ansible automation platform in the infrastructure today to now hook in and link in and be the glue through our incident problem and change process. This is ultimately gonna drive down our mean time to resolution. It's gonna take less headaches uh, or take more headaches away from us while we go through these change processes. Make sure we don't miss important change records or, um, or important ITSM 
ITSM behavior, but also allow us to do this quickly. I hear a lot of the customers that I interact with saying, oh, we don't have that set up in service now because it just takes too long to get that developed. I don't have a workflow for that in service now because um, you know, I'm still waiting on that to get promoted from one instance to, um, to another. Oh, I'm waiting on, you know, I'm waiting on my developer um, to get back to me so that I can add this field to the CMDB or so that I can update this field from the Tower API to, to service now. And we all know from Ansible that it is so quick to write these playbooks and to take a variable or a fact and gather it from the infrastructure and configure, um, orchestrate how I'm going to de deploy an application or how I'm going to build a system. And now that I have these, these modules to integrate into ServiceNow as well, I can just start slotting those in, write a couple roles that automatically open up the change tickets that I need to see when people include those from, uh, from my private automation hub. And now I can move really, really fast while still being in compliant with my, with my internal governance. So um, there's a lot of, of great stuff that is, um, that is coming with the ServiceNow collection. And I think now we're going to walk through a couple of the uh, question and answers with Colin. Yeah, sounds good, Will. Um, thanks a lot. That was a fantastic demo. In fact, we have a direct quote from Robin Price. I think that same name sounds familiar to me. Um, he says this is the greatest demo he's ever seen. He really appreciates your work. Um, you also got a lot of kudos for your, your Grafana configuration there, so I don't know if you wanted to touch on any of that. Uh, but we do have a few questions that are unanswered that have come through while we were going through the demo here. Um, one, so I kind of gave David um, sort of a, a poor answer and kicked the can down the road a little bit. But he's asking, do you need write access in order to use the plugin on the CMDB? He just wants to read access and pull data out of the CMDB. Um, I said this is actually something that I have to test. I'm not not positive, but in my opinion, I feel like you could probably within your custom credential that you're creating just specify under a read-only role within ServiceNow. But do you have any any additional information there? Um, I I know for um, for the, the dynamic inventory, you don't need write access, and I don't believe for any of the info modules, if you wanted to look up a change request and grab some information out of that to know what's, what systems are um, you know, allowed to go through a reboot, for example. That you should be able to do just with read access to your ServiceNow instance. Okay, perfect. And David, I can follow on with a link um, just out to the, the upstream GitHub repository, um, unless you have access through Ansible Automation Platform subscription, um, where you can take a look at some of the, some of the specifics of the modules. Um, Okay, Steve requests, let's see, have you pulled those survey details from a system via REST at point of deployment or just a tower survey with multiple options? Trying to, um, where would those survey details be? <laughs> I'm trying to remember back in the demo where that actually occurred. I'm not sure if you have any insight there, Will. Um, sorry, can you ask that one one more time? I'm looking for it in the in the list. Yeah, have you pulled those survey details from a system via REST at point of deployment or just a tower survey with multiple options? It sounds like a dynamic survey question versus yeah. uh, static options. Yeah, so I'm, uh, yeah, so those are, the surveys are statically configured. And actually, if you, you know, one of the big use cases for putting, um, for using your ServiceNow catalog and then the ServiceNow catalog with the Ansible spoke that Massimo talked about, all a job in uh, a job in your Ansible controller, is because now you can use data from your CMDB to make more dynamic, um, make more dynamic servers and intake uh, your work that way. Now, what you saw in in Tower, it's not quite dynamic, but what I do have is I have a maintenance job that's on a schedule every single night that uses the certified collection for Ansible Tower in order to um, use the certified collection for VMware to gather all of my networks, all of my clusters, all of my data centers in vCenter, and then I use the certified collection for Ansible Tower to update 
uh, that server via via the API. So no custom API calls, all very uh, very low code, just modules in it. Um, in a playbook and a Jinja template, but that's how I build out that um, that survey that's including information from other sources. It's still in a static form; it's not going to update real time. But I, you know, I if I add a network today, it's going to be in the uh, in the form tomorrow. Okay, awesome. And I think we have a related question here that just came in through uh, from from Michael. Um, he says, "How do you customize memory, CPU, disk, etc., assuming multiple users with variable requirements? Um, in addition, um, are you able to create a Linux VM without deploying or cloning a template?" So, um, yeah, Michael, what I've done in the past for that is use uh, use variables files as a, a template for different different users. So I might have a standard a variables file that's here's a standard uh, Microsoft SQL server, here's a standard Postgres server, here's a standard application server. And those all live in my Git repository. And then I choose the template when I go through and deploy. Then if somebody wants something custom, they come to my um, to my re repository with my playbooks in it. They make a uh, pull request against that repository and add their own custom config. Once I accept that pull request, maybe we have to meet about it, discuss about it, so forth. Once I accept that pull request, that template would then end up as something that they could choose to deploy in the future. All right, sounds good. Um... Lucas uh, is, is pointing out your, your template naming standard, and I think he's referring to, so if you kind of go back to the workflow that you had created, the workflow visualizer, you have um, headings like server and service now. Um, you want to talk about your template naming standard there? Yeah, so that's just a way to kind of prefix the name of my template so it groups them all together. I got tired of looking through for open firewall port on, a, on an ASA versus open firewall port on on a server or the things that I'm gonna, the jobs that I wanna have in service now are the things that I'm gonna have against VMware. So just prefixing them there with kind of their high level category and then I do a forward slash and then what the actual playbook is, just logically groups them together so it's easier for me to find things. Awesome, great, great. Um, we have a new one coming in from Mohammed. Does ServiceNow collection also provide options to create tasks and requests? Um, Massimo, do you do you want to take that one? If he's still out there. So what's, what's the question again? Because no, no, I'm here. I'm definitely here. <laughs> I just didn't hear a question in what in what Colin said. I didn't hear a question. Yeah, sure. I, I... Does the service now collection also provide options to create tasks and requests? Yes. Um, so yes, yes to both, basically. Um, and uh, the um, there, those are part of the of the base modules, basically. So it's uh, so change requests, and uh, um, I believe that change request is one of the basic items. And then we have incidents, and then we have uh, um, there is a slide with a whole list of things that we can do. But yes. The answer is yes, and and tasks as well. And they can update, of course. They can update requests and update tasks. Awesome, thank you, Massimo. Uh, there was a follow-on comment um, about the ServiceNow read-only question that we had a little bit earlier. Um, there's just a reference to an auditor role that might be a good way to address that question. So it's you could apply the auditor role to a specific user. It sounds like, and that will specify read-only access through the info modules and the inventory plugin as well. Um, let me see what else do we have going on here. Okay, um, I noticed the service now the service request module was not included here. Will it ever be included? Um, Massimo, that might be one for you. I'm not sure if, if that has been scoped for inclusion or if there's an operation there that we're, or functionality there that we're missing that, that we might want to check out in a future release. So uh, we are actually scoping the next release of, um, of this collection, meaning that we're adding a bunch of new functionalities. And uh, in theory, the service request is part of that scoping, but basically you can either 
um, you can either open uh, opening a um, um, it, it request in the GitHub repo, and we can pick that up. Um, or you can just wait and see what is the next plan. So we 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 started scoping today, basically. <laughs> so there is not a full list of features that we have in there yet. Um, but so since we are doing the scoping, the idea is that you go on GitHub and you you know post a request there, and we'll pick that up. Um, or you know you just wait and see what the release will will contain in the next in the next iteration. Okay, sounds good, Mauricio. Thanks for the question. I just added a link to the upstream repository for this collection, um, so you can make a request there or, or get some in, any additional information. Um, let's see. I think I have a new one coming in. Can Ansible have capabilities for ServiceNow bulk ticket closing? And that one. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how we want to answer that. Yeah, I, you know, I believe you I could probably see. use like. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't see. I don't see why not. We have uh, we have modules that allow you to look up. Um, we have underscore info modules that allow you to look up incidents, and then you can use the actual incident module to take actions on those incidents, make changes. If you've worked with like the EC2 modules before, the info for gaining gathering information, and then the actual module for for making changes, and then just you know gather make a query against the. Um, against your incidents for all the ones containing your criteria. Uh, gather those back, register those in your playbook, and then loop over those, setting all of them to, to closed. And, um, and there go your tickets. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think that's a, a fantastic way to kind of uh, join the info modules with, with, uh, with something that's actually going to execute that change, right? Um, so, so that makes a lot of sense to me. Hopefully that makes uh, makes sense to answer that that question. Um, let's see. Uh, running, a, we got about five, six minutes left. Uh, Daniel asks, is there a function to allow the ServiceNow change implement button to trigger an Ansible job template to deploy the change? I don't know, Will, if you know that one. Um, that might be a, a ServiceNow question. What, uh, what was that one? Is there a function to allow the ServiceNow change implement button to trigger an Ansible job template to deploy the change? Yes, and it would be the Ansible spoke. Your ServiceNow implement change button could be backed by a workflow in ServiceNow, and then the spoke uh, would trigger your job in Ansible um, in Ansible controller. Um, so. Uh, like we've, we've mentioned a few times, but the spoke is is kind of built and and um, man, maintained by ServiceNow. So if you're interested in that sort of functionality, reach out to uh, reach out to them. They can help um, help you understand how to fit that into a workflow. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it sounds like spoke is sort of a one way integration from ServiceNow into Ansible Automation Platform. Whereas the ServiceNow ITSM content collection that we've we've debuted and introduced as a part of Ansible Automation Platform sort of completes that circle, right? It goes from Ansible Automation and and posts all that record information back to ServiceNow. So it, uh, you know, combining Spoke with the certified collection really completes that that loop of automation. Yeah, I would use I would use the spoke to trigger the job, and then use the and then use the content collection to update the change as um, as it's executing. That way, you yep. get the full the full closed loop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, great point. Um, Anup asks, is there a license cost to enable any modules in Ansible Tower? And I'm very happy to say that that no. Um, everything is included with the Ansible Automation Platform subscription. Um, there are built-in modules uh, supplied by, you know, uh, collections built into Ansible. But then we also have certified content collections available from Automation Hub, which are also all included with your Ansible Automation Platform subscription. And that's where you'll actually find the ServiceNow ITSM content collection certified from our Automation Hub. Um, let's see. Do you know when the new web UI interface from AWX will make its way into Tower? Yes, this is going to be a part of uh, release of Ansible Automation Platform version two. 
um, happening over um, this summer in uh, North America. So in the next uh, next few months or so. I'm not sure if Massimo, you want to add anything there. The question again was just the new web UI from AWX, when it will make its way into Tower. It would be um, it would be in the next release of the platform. It should be I think it's, it's scheduled for the next release of the platform. Um, but it's a good opportunity to remind people that now we are changing the naming convention of the components. So Ansible Tower is no more or will be no more. It will be called Ansible Controller. Yep. Thanks for the reminder. I needed that one myself. Thanks, Massimo. <laughs> I think there's also a second part of that question um, around, um, oh, sorry, I just scrolled away from it. Also part of this going from Docker Compose to Kubernetes. Um, so part of the next release of the platform, there's also going to be an OpenShift um, operator as well. I'm not sure if you want to add any additional information there, Massimo. Um, I'm not sure I have any additional information, to be honest. I would love to add some, yep. but I'm not sure I have any additional information to what we already said. Yeah, sounds good. I think that question might be answered in the coming months as we march toward the next release of Ansible Automation Platform. All right. Correct. Um, yes, Tower is changing its name to Ansible uh, to Automation Controller. Um, you'll see some additional name changes as well with the release of the next version of the platform. Um, is there anything available on Galaxy? Um, yes, so this this collection that we've highlighted today is available on Galaxy, sort of as the upstream version. That's what we see. Um, uh, that's how we see Galaxy operating within this entire ecosystem. So um, AWX may be the uh, is the upstream for for Ansible Tower today, right? Um, Galaxy is sort of the upstream um, content repository for collections available on Automation Hub. So therefore. A version of ServiceNow ITSM collection is available on Galaxy, but it is not certified or supported by uh, by Red Hat or the joint agreement that we have with uh, with uh, ServiceNow. All right, I think that's about all that we have time for. I'm seeing just a minute left here. Uh, these are all really really refreshing questions. Thank you very much for for paying attention and 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 bringing some good content back to the demonstration and, and presentation today. But with that, I think we're about ready to close it out. Yes. So, like I said, this has been recorded, and everyone will get um, a link to the recording in the slides. Thank you again, everyone, for joining, and I hope that you have a great rest of your week.